Hello everyone, the second e-waste haul has graced us with yet more Baby AT systems, and you know I'm just going mad with curiosity. For those of you who don't know, this was a very popular case style back in the early to mid 90s, and it's been one of my favorites ever since then. So let's tear into these. There is no way I wasn't going to start with this one. That five and a quarter inch hard drive has me way too curious. I don't think it's an MFM drive, I think this system is a little too new for that. That is probably a three and a half inch to five and a quarter inch adapter carrying an IDE drive, but I certainly hope I'm wrong about that. And here's something else that you kids may have never seen before. This thing uses a toggle switch for power. And that switch actually disconnects mains voltage from the power supply. No ACPI here. And of course we have our seven segment display. This is usually used as a clock speed indicator and the digits should change when you engage the turbo button. And of course we have a reset button and key lock. And this thing seems to be some kind of computer. Well, that mystery is solved. Come on, kids, let's go home. I haven't played with a true AT system in a while. This is gonna be fun. We've got our AT style keyboard connector there. The peripheral cards are pretty standard fare for the time. We've got a game port up here. Got our dial up modem here. Some kind of sound card, some kind of video card. And this card is most likely our IO controller. That includes a disc controller for the floppy and hard drive. Okay, let's get this thing open. Now it's time to experience one of my favorite sounds ever, the sound of an AT tower opening. Okay, yeah, that five and a quarter inch hard drive is in fact an adapter. We've got an IDE drive in there, and something looks very wrong with that CD-ROM drive. I'm trying to imagine how this would happen. <laughs> okay, well, we'll have to explore that. I see somebody janked some coarse thread screws into the fine pitch screw holes there. That's not a good sign. Wonder what else we're gonna find in here. And we have even more signs of trouble. That is a Varta barrel battery, and it has leaked. Luckily, it doesn't look too bad, at least from what I can see. So let's just hope for the best. However, we are fully populated with 30 pin SIM RAM, and it appears that all of the CPU cache chips are present as well. So things are definitely looking up for this system. And buried under these massive amounts of cables, I see we have a socket three CPU. So that's definitely a 486. And now I see this is a VLB system. Yep, we definitely got three VLB slots down there. That is awesome, I knew this thing was a gem. And oddly enough, there's that missing foot. How on earth it got inside the case is definitely beyond me, but at least I can reattach it now. All right, let's get all these drives disconnected. And here's another history lesson for the kiddos. This was back in the day when IDE CD-ROM drives were still pretty new. And before a tappy, every CD-ROM manufacturer had their own proprietary protocol. And the interface for it was usually provided by the sound card. And this CD-ROM actually is IDE. However, the proprietary connectors for Mitsumi and Panasonic look no different than IDE. So you gotta be a little bit careful with that. In some cases, confusing one for the other could damage hardware. Let's get that disconnected. Let's go ahead and get this game port breakout shield out of our way. Now let's check out that modem. And that's a classic US Robotics. Still has the plastic on the IO shield. As tempted as I am to peel that off, I'm not going to. Looks like it's from 1996. Now let's check out that sound card. And it's a reveal sound card with a crystal chipset and a real OPL3 chip. That is definitely what you want to see. Overall, pretty clean little card. Just a bit dusty, but definitely a gem. All right, let's see that video card. Got a very nice S3 VLB video card with the VRAM expansions fully populated. That is very nice to see. Very happy about that. Now I can finally get rid of that game port because it was pinned under the graphics card. Now let's check out that IO controller. Disconnected hard drive LED. Very nice VLB I.O. controller. Super clean as well. Okay, now we can get out that CPU because I am dying to know more. I really hope these clips don't break. Oh, it's actually a 586. Very nice. I'm gonna actually leave that in there for right now because I have to pull this entire motherboard anyway. All right, let's get that front panel disconnected. Now let's get power disconnected. 
hand. I know I brag on this every time I have an AT tower on the channel, but I just have to make sure the world knows about this. This is one of my favorite and most missed features of an AT case. Watch how easy it is to get these motherboards out. Let's get these screws out of here. And the entire motherboard tray just comes right out. Couldn't be simpler. Okay, we may have caught that leaky battery just in time. It doesn't look like it's done too much trace damage. And for those of you who don't know, Varta is the most sinister name in all of the retro PC world. These are nickel metal hydride batteries that leak all the time, and their electrolyte is highly corrosive and will destroy the motherboard if left alone too long. So if you have a retro computer from the 80s and 90s, there's a good chance it has one of these batteries in it. So you may want to go check that. And if you find one in there, get that thing cut out immediately. Let's go ahead and cut that one off. Yeah, we just may have lucked out here. That looks like pretty simple trace repair so far. We're not looking too bad on the underside of the board either. Although this standoff is stuck to the screw, so I'll just have to clamp a pair of vice grips on it to remove that screw. It's probably going to be kind of tricky to get this on camera. There we go. As for the motherboard itself, it seems to be manufactured by a company called Mtech. The only way I know that is by googling this model number here. The RetroWeb does have some information on this motherboard, however they don't have any BIOS images on file. So I'm going to go ahead and dump that BIOS and hopefully it's good and get that uploaded. And here's a good shot of that chipset. And here's a good shot of the BIOS chip. Now prior to starting trace repair I like to pull everything off the motherboard that is removable. So let's start with the RAM, why not? It's got the nice metal clips. And that's a 4 meg stick. These all actually look identical. If they are I'll just jump cut to the end. And yeah, yep, identical indeed. Okay, so the first four were identical. This one is different and completely unmarked. Except for the chip part numbers, of course. Let's see if it's identical from there. And indeed they are. So we could have about 32 megs of RAM in this thing. Now let's get that CPU off of there. No trouble with those pins at all. Oh well, goodbye warranty. <laughs> Wow, they really wanted to make that obvious. This is going to be a mess. Now let's get those cache chips off of there. Now the keyboard BIOS. And finally the BIOS ROM. Now I'll go ahead and strip all these jumpers off, and don't worry, I took real good pictures. Now you don't necessarily have to strip the motherboard like this, but in my opinion the fewer little places for water to hide the better, because this board's going to get washed and rinsed several times. Okay now we have to neutralize the battery electrolyte, and for that I'm just going to use some white vinegar mixed with distilled water at like 20% concentration. Let's just work that in. And then we'll let that sit for a few minutes, and once that's done we'll do the same thing for the other side. And now that that's done, I'm going to give this thing a thorough wash with soapy water, and then I'm going to rinse it like it's never been rinsed before, using distilled water. Okay, this board is washed, rinsed, and dried. I'm actually feeling good about it. I think we caught that battery with plenty of time to spare. Let's go ahead and remove that corrosion and solder mask. I'm just going to use this rubber polishing bit on a Dremel. That works really well. Okay, so far it looks like we only have a couple of broken traces. This one here, and this one here, both related to the battery connection. Let's look at the other side of the board. Yeah, I think we might have lucked out. Now, I do want to clean out those vias, so I'm going to use one of these itty bitty drill bits to flush them out. That way I just knock out any corrosion that might still be in there. Okay, let's do some trace repair. Let's start with this one here that's broken short of the via. Get some flux on that. And some used desoldering braid works great for tinning up traces. Might as well hit that one over there too. You know what? Let's just hit all of these. Now I'm going to flow some additional solder on this trace here. Now let's get a little piece of wire down through that via to the other side of the board. Let's get that bent into position a little better. 
add a little bit of flux, and solder it down. Okay, that's looking good enough. You gotta look at these things at multiple angles because sometimes those reflections can look like solder balls. Okay, let's trim up the excess. There we go. Now let's come over to the other side of the board and get some flux on that. I really should have tinned that trace first, but we're gonna go with it. Let's just pull that into position without pulling it out from under the microscope. So hard to hold this thing stable. Now let's solder this side down. All right, that connection should be good and strong. Let's go ahead and trim that up. Okay, back on the top side of the board. I gotta work on the trace next to it. But first I gotta get that solder plug out of that via. Let's see if some desoldering braid can do it. I don't even know if this trace goes anywhere, but it could be connecting to one of the middle layers of the board. So we'll go ahead and straighten it out anyway. Okay, well I got most of it. Let's just clean that via out with a little bitty drill bit. Now let's flush some IPA down there. Now I can get a wire through there. Let's add some flux and solder that down. Trim, trim, and clean up. Now back on the top side, let's just bridge it over to that broken trace. Flux is your friend. Now we'll solder that down. Okay, I didn't want to bore you with more of the same, so I completed the trace repairs off camera. One thing I do want to make special note of is, anytime copper corrodes like this, it loses its thickness, which reduces its current carrying capacity. So it's important to help restore that by tinning them up with solder. So I've just gone over all of those traces that were exposed to corrosion. The tinning also helps protect the copper against oxidation. But of course, the best defense against oxidation is to restore the solder mask which I will be doing, but first let's test this motherboard out and make sure the repairs are complete. I've jumped a couple of leads off the original battery terminal so that we can connect an external battery. I believe this connector here is for an external battery, but I'm not completely sure, so I'm just not even gonna mess with it for now. Okay, before we get too ahead of ourselves, let's make sure this board is working. I've got that VLB video card connected, so let's see. And yes it is. Got 32 megs of RAM. Okay, we're looking good so far. Now, one of the most common issues when these batteries wreck the board is loss of keyboard functionality, so let's test that. Let's try getting set up. Yes, we have a functioning keyboard. Can't really test any further until we get into an OS. But yeah, this board is working. Awesome. Okay, now we can seal up the board. I'm gonna use this UV curable solder mask. This stuff works pretty well. It's just some cheap stuff I found on Amazon. And I don't have any in gold. I only have black and green, so Black's gonna have to do. I think black and gold should look pretty good. Let's just spread that around. We need to spread it as thinly as possible. Now let's try to flatten that out a little bit. I'm definitely no artist with this stuff. Okay, that'll have to do. It's not pretty, but it works. Now I'll put it under my UV light to cure. And this solder mask stays workable for hours until you put it under the light, so it's really convenient. And once this side is done, I'll do the same thing for the other side. Okay, that solder mask is all cured up now. It took about 10 minutes. Now let's go ahead and hot glue these wires down. Otherwise they're gonna break off as soon as I look at them wrong. Now as for what replacement battery I'm gonna be using, I really don't have a more cromulent replacement for the Varta batteries on hand. So I'm just gonna use a CR2032 in its place. That's not the most ideal battery for this application, but it'll work perfectly fine for testing. One important thing to note is the motherboard is gonna try to charge that battery. So you have to put a diode in place to prevent that. A diode acts like a one-way valve for electricity, so electricity can flow in this direction just fine, but it can't flow in this direction. That way the battery's voltage can make it to the motherboard, but the motherboard's voltage can't make it to the battery. And that's the oversimplified explanation for it. There's other things to consider like voltage drop and stuff like that, but I just grabbed a random diode out of a power supply, tested it out, it behaved as expected, and that's good enough for now. Now let's turn our attention to that CPU cooler. Miraculously, none of those plastic clips broke when I removed it. However, that bearing doesn't sound too great. Let's see what it sounds like with some power. Yeah, not the quietest thing in the world. It's definitely rattly. I guess let's see if I can take that fan off without breaking it because it looks like it's just interference fit on these plastic tabs. And that could be tricky. Okay, it's coming. There we go. Got the dust removed from both of those. 
Let's see if we can help that fan bearing. And you know the drill. Cut into the label. That gives you access to the bearing. Drip some three-in-one oil down there. Just a drop will do. And then run the fan. Let's the oil work in. And it already sounds a lot better. Now using IPA, clean up any excess oil you may have gotten on the surface here. Amazingly, I didn't get any on there. So I'm just gonna proceed to the next step. And that is to take some Kapton tape and seal it up. And that's K-A-P-T-O-N, Kapton tape. In case you're wondering, let's trim up that excess. And there we go. Now let's go ahead and dump that BIOS ROM so that we can get it uploaded to the retro web. And that's a TI chip. 27C512 and DIP28. Let's get that in the programmer. Now read. All right, that reads. It does look a little funny with the doubling of some of the characters. I wonder what's up with that. Let's try reading that again. Okay, I got the same result. Maybe that's how it's supposed to be. Okay, well, at least it's consistent. Let's go ahead and save it. Okay, well, Modbin likes it. So I guess that dump is good. I honestly don't dump BIOSes very often. Yeah, everything seems consistent. I'd say we're good. Okay, now that the motherboard's finally squared away, let's move on to the rest of the system. Let's get these drives out of here. And the truth is revealed. That's a Western Digital Caviar 2540, 540 megabytes, manufactured March 1995. And I just love this enclosure. I kind of want to put it in one of my modern systems. <laughs> that would just look too funny. I probably won't though. This looks a lot better in a period correct machine. And we do have a secondary hard drive in there. It is also a Western Digital Caviar, this time 2.5 gigabytes, manufactured August 1996. And this one is configured as the master, so this must be our boot device. Hopefully it works. The CD drive is a reveal, but we already knew that. Manufactured September 1995. And I'm still not sure why it was falling apart like that because just from me removing it and squeezing the back, it seems to have reset itself. I think the system must have taken some pretty significant shock at some point. Yeah, see, I can't even really get it to come back apart again. I guess we'll see how it goes. A lot of these screw holes are pretty wrecked though. Somebody tried their hardest to force the wrong type of screws in these. The floppy drive is a Mitsumi, model D359T3, from Neutronics or not so Neutronics. Spindle's not stuck. Feels perfectly fine. Let's get this thing open. Yeah, it's pretty nasty in there. Looks like we have some corrosion. Let's just try to clean this thing up as best we can. Now let's clean those heads. Actually pretty clean, surprisingly. Let's see if I can clean up that corrosion a little bit. Yeah, that's not coming off easily. It shouldn't hurt anything though. Let's refresh the grease on that lead screw, starting by cleaning the old grease off. And let's just advance that a little bit. Now let's get some new grease on that. There we go. Now moving on to the power supply. It seems like a pretty high quality one, just based on the way it's constructed. It has decent weight and it doesn't feel like you can crumple it up like a ball of tin foil. Well, let's get it open and see what it's like inside. And before I do that, let me preface this by saying power supplies are incredibly dangerous. So don't go taking one apart unless you know exactly what you're doing, because you probably won't like getting electrocuted. And the last thing I need is your ghost haunting me. So yeah, don't try this at home unless you know what you're doing. And yes, I'm seeing good quality Celastic, Rubicon caps, all signs of a high quality power supply. I just gotta get this dust out of here. Okay, the dust is busted. Let's see what it does. Okay, we're doing just fine so far. Okay, I decided I wanted to stress this thing out a little bit more. So I've connected a 60 watt automotive light bulb to it. Let's see what it does now. Shield your eyes. All right, we're still looking good. We haven't really dropped voltage too much. I think it's making a lot of glare. I'm gonna give that five minutes or so. All right, that's five minutes. Power supply took it like a champ. It has earned my trust. Okay, before I get this thing back together, let's go ahead and reattach that fourth foot. I'm just gonna use some hot glue. Might as well flare it out up top, why not? I should probably keep some new replacements of these on hand. 
That's if I can even find any. Now that I'm looking more closely at the base of this thing, I see it's a little bit cattywampus. Yeah, this system must have gotten whacked at some point. That explains that damaged CD-ROM drive. Let's just see if I can bend that back into shape with no precision whatsoever. Close enough. I just discovered that we're missing the seven segment clock speed indicator. Well, that hurts, but honestly, it shouldn't be that hard to make a modern replacement for it. That's definitely not happening this week, but that is now in my plans. All right, it's time to test. I've got everything reinstalled. And of course, I realized that switch was backwards after I installed everything. I'd have to take the motherboard back out in order to flip that around. So it's just gonna have to be bass backwards for now. Let's see what it does. All right, we're posting. The hard drives sound reasonably happy. And of course we have checksum error because dead battery. Let's try to just continue and see if it auto detects the hard drives. Okay, I'd say that's a no. It's kind of strange that that hard drive LED stayed on for a while. I wonder if that drive is having some trouble. But before we assume that, let's try setting the drive up manually in the BIOS. Here we go, hard drive auto detection. Option one is correct. And option one is correct for D drive. Let's see what that gets us. Ooh, sounds like we're booting. Yep, Windows 95. Yes. So at least the C drive works. Ooh, we got a name on here. We have to blur that. And we don't have a password, but fortunately we don't need one in Windows 95. We just hit cancel. Well, let's see what we have on this thing. Open Office. That's interesting. And of course it has AOL. Let's see if they're actually using it. And yes, indeed they were. Wow, seeing this interface just gets me every time. Let's see if they had any favorites in here. No favorite places. What kind of early surfers of cyberspace were they? Let's see how many accounts we have on here. We got three accounts. Nothing more wholesome than a family using AOL 3.0. My heart is full. All right, let's get out of here. What else do we have? We don't have a whole lot. I'm kind of surprised I'm not seeing more games with that sound card in there. This is really looking like a school or office computer. Let's see, what is MTG? Making the grade. What's that all about? Yeah, this thing came from a school. Or at least was being used by a teacher. And it wants a password. Guess I'm not hacking my grades today. Let's get out of here. Yeah, these documents definitely suggest school usage. Okay, let's see what that D drive does. Okay, it works. Nothing on there except a single file with that user's name on it. That's very strange. And we got five hidden files, so let's reveal those. Reveal your secrets. Okay, whatever those are. Let's get out of here. Let's see what's on C drive. Yeah, no games. That poor OPL sound chip is going to waste. And I just noticed our floppy drive is not configured correctly. I'm gonna have to go back in the BIOS and look at that. But let's see if that CD-ROM drive works. It'll be a miracle if it does. Okay, well it opens without any fuss. A little bit dusty in there. Let's see if it reads. Well, it didn't sound at all healthy, but it is reading. Yeah, that thing's working. <laughs> All right, let's get out of here. You know what? Let's give both the CD-ROM drive and the D drive some exercise. Let's try copying the contents of the CD over to D drive. Control A, Control C. Do it. Okay, that's working. That hard drive LED is cool. I don't care who you are. It's an awfully quiet drive, though. Maybe that CD-ROM drive is just not enough to stress it out. And we did complete copying successfully. I guess we're good. I'm pretty impressed considering the condition of that CD-ROM drive when I found it. Okay, I went into the BIOS and straightened out that floppy drive. So let's see if it works.
And yes, indeed it does. Fantastic. Well, let's drop down to DOS and check out those hard drives then. Ta-da! Microsoft sure was proud of themselves. Okay, let's start with C drive. Oh, well, hard drive sounds good. It's nice and crunchy. Okay, no file system trouble. Let's see what Surface Scan finds. Okay, I think we're gonna make it. Yeah, that is one healthy drive. Now let's check the D drive. I just love that LED. Looks like that drive's gonna make it too. Yes, indeed. Awesome. Got two healthy drives. Okay, now let's get this thing cleaned up. It looks like it only needs basic cleaning, so let's see how far that gets us. Just using some Windex and a paper towel. I'm gonna start in this grimy area under the switch. Yeah, that's working. Well, it's not working out for these scuffs down here. Let's try IPA. Okay, yeah, that did it. Looking a lot better. Now, as for the outer metal, I can get rid of this tape residue, but there's not much I can do about that paint damage right now. I gotta break out my HVLP spray gun and get back into that. That video may yet come. But for the tape residue, I'm gonna use some WD-40 to soften it up. Now, let's just scrape it off with a guitar pick. Well, that's as good as this one's getting for now. Well, I'd say I definitely got lucky with this one. The motherboard repair was nice and easy. Got two healthy hard drives from the mid-90s, a super cool hard drive bay adapter, and everything else works? Yeah, I can hardly believe it. I just have to figure out a modern replacement for that seven-segment display. That'll actually make a fun little project. Let's move on to the next system. Next system is this delightful looking thing. I'm about 90% sure we have a seven-segment display back there. We shall see. This thing claims to be a Pentium system, so it most likely does not make use of the turbo functionality. We do have some yellowing, but this case is actually in fairly good condition. Just like the first system has the power toggle switch. And a stiff one at that. That thing could use some exercise. And here's the back side of the machine. Conspicuously absent is any kind of sound card. This machine must have been all work and no play. We just have our parallel port up there, our 9 and 25 pin serial ports, some kind of video card, and our dial-up modem. You see we have some sketchily scribbled port labels there. All right, let's get this thing open. Wow, this system is remarkably clean. I'm seeing only very light coatings of dust where there even is dust. But we are unfortunately missing the hard drive. That's too bad. However, we do indeed have a seven segment display. It's not of much use on a Pentium system, but I feel like this case probably deserves a 486 anyway. Yeah, here's our unused turbo switch, but that's no surprise with this thing being a Socket 7 motherboard. Speaking of the CPU, let's see what we have. Classic Intel Pentium 1, with not a hint of thermal grease, and even worse, a label under there. Back in these days, thermal grease was not a common consideration, and things did get along just fine without it, but it's definitely better to have it. And above the CPU, I see we have our COAST module, and COAST stands for cash on a stick. That is the actual technical term for it. Okay, time to clear some cables. Let's get these serial and parallel port shields out of here. Let's get power off the board. And we have two 72 pin SIM modules, and these slots have gold retention tabs. This motherboard's fancy. Let's check those out. No markings on that side. And we've got us a good old-fashioned mystery module. RAM manufacturers certainly enjoy their riddles. Let's check out the next one. And that's an identical stick. I'm gonna guess 16 megabytes total. We'll have to see what it counts up to. Now let's check out that video card. Got a Diamond Stealth 64 with the VRAM expansions fully populated. Beautiful. And super clean as well. 
Now let's see the dial-up modem. That's a standard issue ISA dial-up modem with Rockwell chips, of course. Looks like it's from 1995. I swear I will find a use for these one day. Okay, so I'm not having the easiest time identifying this motherboard. Just based on my Googling, it looks like it's probably a PC Chips M507 version 1.1 though I do see some subtle differences. If it is, there's an interesting side note about this motherboard. Apparently some of them shipped with fake CPU cache chips, so we will definitely be checking that. Let's actually pull that motherboard out and see. So according to the retro web, the fake cache chips are marked as right back, and two of those definitely are. Well, that's an amusing and mildly infuriating bit of info. I guess all that glitters is not gold. And this motherboard is real loosey-goosey in this tray. You're supposed to be able to put two screws over here, but this board doesn't even have a hole for the second screw. Yeah, I really don't like this motherboard being in this case. This will definitely be getting a 486 or something. But here's a good shot of all the pertinent chips. And that battery still has some charge left, but not nearly enough. Now let's get that CPU out of there and get that stupid warranty sticker off of it. Yeah, I figured it was going to do something annoying like that. IPA should be able to take care of that. That's better. Now, let's see about this fan. It seems okay, but... Let's see what it sounds like under power. Yeah, it doesn't sound great. I'm going to go ahead and give it the usual service. Done and done. Yeah, it's sounding a lot better now. Okay, let's check out these drives. And that floppy drive is your standard issue Panasonic with a hatefully long model number. And this thing is so clean it looks like it could be brand new. We'll see how much of that cleanliness translates to the inside. Yeah, this thing's not just clean, it's super clean. Even the grease is still greasy. But you know me by now, my paranoia. I'm still gonna clean the heads. Can't be wrecking precious discs. Yeah, probably not even a need for that. Now that the heads are dry, let's check that disc mechanism. Feels brand new. Yeah, you know what? I'm still gonna grease that lead screw. I've been burned by that before. Let's get that cleaned up. And that CD-ROM drive is made by Acer, model CD-747E. It doesn't say what speed it is, but I'm gonna guess 4X. Manufactured January 1996. Now let's have a peek inside that power supply. I am fairly certain that it's at least as old as the case, because it has a dedicated power connector for that seven segment display. Well, let's take it apart and see if there's any obvious go bangs in it. And that could be the most comprehensive power supply warning label I've ever seen. Do not remove this cover under any circumstances. So which circumstance would this be? Well, I guess we're just gonna have to go ahead and ignore that one. Bye-bye warranty. Okay, we're not looking too bad in here. Not looking too bad at all. We're looking for leaky or bulgy caps, suspicious looking celastic and obvious burn spots, and I don't see any of that. Let's go ahead and torture it. Ooh, that's not good. It's definitely acting shorted. And we most certainly are not shorted. Let me disconnect the light bulb and see if that helps. Huh. Well, that's interesting. So it wasn't able to start with a heavy load. Well, let's connect it while it's started up, why not? Yeah, it shuts down instantly. Hmm, I don't think this power supply can take the heat. Sounds like it's in protected mode or something. Well, this bulb does have a crazy low resistance, so I guess I can't fault that power supply for going into protected mode. The power supply itself is probably fine. At least we know protected mode is working. All right, time to test. Let's just go ahead and get a DOS boot disk in there since we don't have anything else to boot from. Now let's see what it does. And we are posting. Got 16 megs of RAM. And hey, our seven segment display works. Let's see if it responds to the turbo button. And yes, it does. <laughs> Even though it's not actually doing anything to the motherboard, that's still just so cool. And naturally we have a CMOS error, but that's no surprise. Let's just continue. Hey, that floppy drive is struggling. With how clean that thing was, that's surprising. 
Maybe I've just put that disk through too much. Well, let's try rebooting. Okay, there it goes. Sometimes I just need to move a little bit. And our CD-ROM drive is detected. Well, let's try it out. Ah, barely opens. Oh, there's a CD in there. What on earth is that? It's a music CD. Jay Strauss. This is actually a pretty old CD because that's when they still did the uh, AAD or DDD markings. I believe that indicates whether or not the audio was recorded digitally end-to-end -end versus analog to digital or something like that. But I think they stopped doing that in the early 90s. This is a definitely an older looking CD. There's some residue around the middle, which means the spindle inside the drive is decomposing. Well, let's see if it reads. And yes, it does. Sure wish I had a hard drive to copy something to, but let's see if it's left residue on that disc, assuming I can get it open. Well, it opens right up. Yeah, there's a little bit of residue there, and that's coming from the rubberized coating on the spindle. So that would have to be stripped off and recoded, otherwise known as a project for another time. Well, let's go ahead and run speed sys. Get some benchmarks. Okay, there's our truthful cache numbers. 8K of L1 and 256K of L2. And that 256K is definitely coming from the cache on a stick module. So yeah, those cache chips on the motherboard are actually doing nothing. What a scam. Well, let's go ahead and run the CD drive test, why not? Give it a little workout. And yeah, it looks like it's running at about 4x. Running pretty well, actually. The drive's pretty healthy. Okay, I guess that's all we get with a small disc like this. There isn't much to these AOL CDs space-wise. So I'm actually gonna skip cleaning up this case. It needs a little bit more attention than that. And I have got to get into retro brighting, for sure. But this is definitely a cool case. I'm not gonna keep that scammy motherboard in there though. We need something that can actually use the turbo functionality. Can't let that clock speed indicator be just for show. Let's move on to the next system. Check out this strange looking thing. No, there's nothing wrong with your YouTube machine. This is in fact an inverted AT case. Now I've heard of BTX, but I'm not familiar with any AT equivalents. Was there a BT? I don't know, I'm fairly certain that this has a standard AT motherboard in it. But this up here is the power switch. And this below it is not actually a switch. It's just an arrow, and there seems to be an arrow theme on this case. I guess they were worried that people were gonna get confused as to which orientation was down. We have a three digit seven segment display here. Here's our reset and turbo buttons. From Computer Warehouse Incorporated. Never heard of them. And of course the Funhouse inversion continues at the back of the machine. It's even harder to tell that this case is not actually upside down. That is too weird looking but that looks like a regular old AT motherboard in there. It's just mounted in the opposite direction. You see we have a dial-up modem up there, got some kind of sound card here, got our video card here, and that does look like a PS2 port next to that parallel port. I'm assuming it's only for a PS2 mouse. Our 25 pin serial port's seen better days. It's looking a little bent. Okay, let's get this weird thing open. Should just be like any other AT case. Yeah, this is reminding me of that NEC Ready I did a while back, though this one at least uses standard motherboards. And someone deprived us of the hard drive, sadly. And that is most definitely a Socket 7 Pentium system, which means no turbo functionality. And this here is a hard drive bay. I see someone couldn't quite figure out how these screws worked. Looks like this bracket's supposed to go behind this plate. Let's just go ahead and get the whole thing out of there. This thing is wrecking all my usual camera angles. I guess we'll start with a dial-up modem for once. And yep, it's a dial-up modem for sure. Add another one to the collection. Now let's see that sound card. And that's a Sound Blaster Viber 16 from 1995. And it's funny with this thing being in an inverted case, this side of the board stayed remarkably clean whereas the back side of the board got all the dust. <laughs> that is funny. Now let's check that video card. Got a PCI Trident card with no VRAM expansion, bucking the trend in this video. 
And this card has the opposite problem. The main side got all the dust. Still overall pretty clean. Now let's clear out these cables. Now I also want to get this power supply out of my way, because it's really in my way. And now you can see the horrendous danger that is the AT power switch. And two of these leads actually contain mains voltage. So if you ever work on a case of this vintage, make triple sure that the thing is unplugged. Because mains voltage will be present here whether it's on or off. And if you wire it wrong, you will pop a breaker. I learned that one the hard way, many moons ago. So let's get that switch disconnected. And these usually also have a ground strap somewhere. And here's our power lead for the seven segment display. Comes straight from the power supply. Oh, that's what was making all that noise. It's a sheet metal cover for the drive bay there. It's nice that they just shoved that in the system like that. Now let's get power disconnected. And that motherboard appears to be a Freetech or a Flexus model P5F76. It has plenty of coverage on the retro web, including lots of BIOS dumps. And it takes both SIM and DIM RAM, with SIM RAM being the choice for this system. Let's check those out. No easy info on that side. And none on this side. It's a good old riddle. Let's check out the next one. And that's an identical stick. And an identical riddle. Next. Ooh, that's an awkward spot. Aha, some info. At least we can see this one's a 16 meg stick. I love it when RAM manufacturers actually work with us. And finally. And that stick is identical to the last one, 16 megs EDO. Very nice. Now let's check out that CPU. Whoa, did somebody actually use thermal compound on a ceramic CPU? Yes, they did. I'm glad to see somebody was doing it right. And that's obviously an Intel Pentium 1. That chip is quite filthy, so let's get that cleaned up before I pull it out. Let's catch that dust with a microfiber cloth. Now let's check those pins. And they all look good. See an annoying warranty sticker there, but at least that's a proper place for it, not interfering with thermal transfer like the last one. And we got a fully charged battery there. That saves me tens of cents. Now let's check those drives. And that CD-ROM drive is made by Delta, manufactured in August 2000, so definitely a later addition to this system. This thing has quite some weight to it. I'm kind of curious what's going on in there. This thing feels like it weighs about five pounds. I kind of hope it doesn't work so I can take it apart and see where all that gravity is coming from. And hey, what do you know? Another Mitsumi D359T6 drive. Spindle is spindly. And we have another one of those warranty stickers. And now that I'm actually looking closely, I see it has a date on there. May 13th, 1997. I gotta see if that matches up with the sticker on the CPU. But for right now, that is violated. Ugh, this thing is a mess. Let's clean that out. I'm gonna have to take this faceplate off. It's really in the way. As well as this door. Man, that thing's gross. And you know the rest. And this one has a lot of miles on it. So I found another one of those warranty stickers on the back of the motherboard, and that date matches the one on the floppy drive. And oddly enough, the one on the CPU has a later date. It's very strange. Now, how on earth do I get this fan off? This thing is seeming awfully enigmatic. Aha. Uh -huh. I think we're getting somewhere. There we go. And hey, it didn't even break. Bonus. Let's see what that fan even sounds like. Actually, it sounds pretty good. Yeah, I'm not even gonna mess with that. Let's just get it cleaned up. And two sneezing fits later, that thing's clean. So I'm actually gonna use paste on this CPU. I normally use pads on CPUs this large, but I don't have any on hand. 
So paste is going to have to do. Now let's crack this depth supply open and see what's going on in there. All right, we're looking good in here. Let's see if we can get it to die. Okay, we're gonna see if this one can start with the headlight connected. So let's see. Yeah, yes it does. We're a little bit low on the 12 volt rail. Let's see how that changes when I remove the headlight. Okay, it normalizes. But I want to torture this thing, so let's get that back connected. And just let it suffer for a while. All right, there's nothing wrong with that thing. Okay, well, let's see what it does. And it is posting. Counted 64 megs of RAM. That's a lot of RAM for the mid-90s. I love that they have the seven segment display set correctly. Let's see if the turbo button changes it. Well, kinda. <laughs> I guess they didn't even bother. All right, floppy disks fail. That's weird. Cable's definitely in the right direction. Let's go in the setup. Okay, well, it's expecting the correct type of drive. Guess I'll try another cable. There we go. Let's get a boot disk in there. And that floppy drive is failing. So I'm not completely sure if it's the drive or the disk. At this point, it could be either one. Let's keep trying. Again. I'm gonna guess it's probably that disk. It has been through a lot. All right, here's a fresh DOS boot disk. Let's try that. Yeah, there we go. And got a CD driver. Let's see if the CD drive works. Ah, it's stuck. Not an uncommon issue. There we go. Just a wee bit dusty. Well, it sounds like it spins up. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. That thing works. But I kind of wanted to take it apart. I'm not going to, though. I'm already nearly out of time this week for making a video. Well, let's see what SpeedSys thinks of this system. And this motherboard actually has real L2 cache, totaling 512 kilobytes. Let's hear that CD drive scream. I don't know if SpeedSys would know what to make of a 50 speed drive. It seems to be quite confused. And it definitely didn't make it to 50 speeds, because that is quite a sound. It usually sounds like the disc is about to explode because it probably is. Well, let's try to skip this test. See what the full test does. Come on, I want that CD to explode. It claims to be going faster, but it doesn't sound like it's spinning any faster. Well, sadly, our disc survived. But hey, at least the CD-ROM works. Okay, like the first system, I think this thing only needs basic cleaning, at least on the front. So let's see how that goes. Yeah, that's all it took. Looking good. I can't say the same for the side panel, though. That may require something heavier. Let's see. Oh no, it's coming off. Mostly. Well, except for the scratches, this case is actually in really good condition. I'm actually surprised. And the other side is in even better condition. Yeah, I actually really like this one now. I started out not knowing what to think of it, but it has grown on me. Even with the awkward power supply position, I still think it should have a motherboard with actual turbo functionality though. You just don't see inverted AT cases very often. It's definitely unique. Well, that was fun. These things are so classic with their nearly superfluous clock speed indicators. I just love them. Hey, you know who else I love? the fine people on Patreon. Your support is my best chance of making this channel viable, especially when buying massive lots of retro computers every six months. I really appreciate you all. But that's all for this video. Thanks for watching.